So, James, what date is it? Today is yeah. the 19th of February. That's Nin- Wednesday. 19th of February. Okay, and what are we going to do today? Today, we're going to do a really nice favour for our best friend and manager, C.D. Andy. He's been saying since 2011, when he played Pickles in our show Slap and Giggle Revelations, that he really wants to come up to Edinburgh. And he's done a bit of stand-up here and there, hasn't he? Yeah, at least twice. So what he really needs right now is that he needs someone to manage him. Yeah, he needs the support of his best friends. Best friends. So what we're going to do is that we are going to apply for the PBH3 Fringe on Andy's behalf. Keep it a secret. We're going to apply for him, write his show for him, on the assumption that once it's all booked in and we tell him about it, he will have to do it. Yeah. The uh, the catch, of course, is, is that um, with, with us writing it, we have to pretty much do what we say. So... Um, I'm going to try and find uh, right PBH free fringe application. Okay, please describe the show you propose in no more than 200 words. Uh, does this sound like a plausible show? My yes. show is a retrospective anecdotal look at the roller coaster world of comedy management. I'll be recording my brushes with the law and offering advice to any aspiring promotion managers based on. Uh, uh, Based on three on years experience. Based on my three years experience. During which I will also discuss my wider lifestyle, online dating, unemployment and my own short and comedy career. I also serve drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, okay. Are we going to end with a song? Oh god, yes. We at Slap and Giggle have been through a lot, but this year we want to do more for our friends and the community. So this summer, instead of writing a brand new show starring Sid and James doing the usual hijinks, we've decided to do something a little bit different. On top of our new solo shows and a joint show with comedy pals We Are Goose, we are putting on an extra special extra... Hello, Andy Routledge. This is an intervention. For years you have been saying how much you enjoy doing stand-up, yet haven't found a gig for yourself in over two years. So this summer, you have a challenge. On the 16th and 17th of August at 3.30pm at a bar called Pivo in Edinburgh, You have an hour-long show programmed to be performed doing comedy as part of the PBH Free Fringe. Accommodation, publicity, administration, even the script has been prepared for you. All you have to do is show up and entertain the audience. As an added bonus, all the money you receive afterwards will be yours. It's almost like being employed, eh? Do you accept this challenge? If not, you kill this kitten. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the fabulous Mr. Andy Rowley! Yay! 
Are you an aspiring talent manager? I was, but then I was aspiring no more. I made my dreams come true, and I can do the same for you. Over the next 40 minutes, I will read to you from the autobiography that many critics have described as unpublishable. <laughs> I'm also serving drinks. <laughs> Are you thirsty for knowledge? Are you thirsty for power? Are you thirsty in the conventional sense of the word? <laughs> then you've come to the right place. Who am I? I'm Andy Rowledge. Andy Rowledge! Come on with me! Andy, Andy Rowledge! Andy Rowledge! Andy Rowledge! Andy Rowledge! Andy Rowledge! <laughs> Chapter 1. <laughs> I am Andy Routledge. <laughs> but my friends call me Andy. Or refer to me as the accused. <laughs> Until last year, I managed some of the country's biggest comedians. Ross Noble, Russell Howard, Andy Parsons. Yes, those are the sort of clients I wanted to end up managing. But my two biggest clients were the disappointing Manchester-based comedy double act, Sid Wick and James Benison. AKA Slap and Giggle. My clients call me CD Andy. This is mainly due to the fact that I originally sold CDs of my act at their gigs. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a CD, Andy. <laughs> and so, CD Andy. At first, this was hugely unsuccessful. But then I started selling CDs of other acts, and then eventually selling CDs of popular music artists after ripping their music off the internet <laughs> and calling them off the radio. For my entire career, this has been my main source of revenue. <laughs> eventually, I was shut down by most of the major studios when I tried to expand the business by opening a shop. It was going to be a CD emporium named after me. It was called Virgin Megas. <laughs> As I said, that was quickly shut down. And I was sent to prison for a, a third time. <laughs> but the nickname stuck. Now I don't just represent I don't just represent comedy and musical acts though. Due to my dyslexia affecting an advert I put out in the local paper, I also represent comedy and music cats. <laughs> Name a famous cat. Chances are I represent them. Charlie Hawkins, Mr. Chalky Paws, <laughs> Fluff of the Arts, <laughs> all signed Andy Rowledge representation. Have you ever seen have you ever seen Britain's Got Talent? All 18 of the cats I represent have appeared at the auditions for Britain's Got Talent. <laughs> <laughs> to hedge our bets, I entered all 18 in a single act. And I was gonna call it Cat Act. But due to my dyslexia, um, I ended up calling it Attack. <laughs> I decided there I decided there was little time for a few minutes of action, which would distract from the talent of the cats. So it essentially just released 18 cats onto the Britain's Got Talent stage while shouting, Attack! <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, I am a comedy manager, a cat manager, and a CD salesman. <laughs> How did I get there? And where did it all go wrong? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Chapter 2. Andy is the word. <laughs> 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. Every man should have a dream, and my dream is to own 1,000 pounds. <laughs> it's been my dream as long as I can remember. Not just my dream, the dream of my bank manager and my many debt collectors. <laughs> and July this year, my dream was, they almost came true. I managed to raise just shy of a thousand pounds through a combination of high interest loans and organ donation. <laughs> what did I do with the money? I spent it on an Edinburgh show in which I read out my autobiography. <laughs> As a comedy manager, paid work is few and far between, especially for the low quality clients I represent. <laughs> To raise extra cash, I decided to self-publish an autobiography of my life and experiences. Alas, at this time of reading this, I haven't managed to sell a single copy. And this is especially low blow as I only able to afford to publish one copy. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to gigs, I have contacts from Land's End to John O'Groats. That's right, two promoters. 
Back in the day, I was able to book gigs on the same night, so a client of mine was able to fit in two gigs in one evening. I would book a client in for a for Beat the Gong at the Dampen Castle in John O'Groats, requesting to go on early, then in a swift jog into my Citroen Saxo and a brisk drive down the four new faces at the Queen's Arms and Land's End, where I'd request one of the latest spots, say 10.30 or 11 p.m. As you might imagine, this almost never worked. <laughs> and now neither club will book my acts. Land's End, because we never showed up on time, or on the, on the right time or day, and John and Groats, because my acts were of poor standard, with, and I quote, an uncomfortable sense of urgency about finishing their sins. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 3. Look at me, I'm Andy D. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about names. They're overrated and underused. What's the point of a name? After all the clients I've ever represented, I, I remember maybe three of their names. Ask me to name any of my past girlfriends? I can't! <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing about instantly forgetting people's names is that you have the pleasure of meeting the same people over and over again. Sometimes up to five times in the same night. <laughs> Each time an opportunity to make a great first impression. <laughs> and then a chance to try again when it's irretrievably, when it gets in, irretrievably awkward. <laughs> This attitude to names probably mainly stemmed from a brief addiction I had with speed dating, when I got used to meeting lots of people very quickly and then never seeing any of them again. <laughs> <laughs> but names and I, Andy Routledge, have never gone hand in hand. Did you know that Andy Routledge is in fact not my real name? <gasps> I was born Norman Jean, and my parents were convinced I was destined for stardom. They decided the name didn't suit me, and that I'd better suit the name Andy. And also better suit the surname Routledge. <laughs> a surname which no one in my family shares. <laughs> <laughs> so at the age of five, I was marched down into the depot office, and there was the last anyone ever saw of young Norman G. Well, not technically, as three years later my younger brother Norman was born. <laughs> He and my parents really hit it off from the start, and he's currently enjoying a glittering career in Hollywood. <laughs> I've since been called many, many names, almost all of them hurtful, but none of them my birth name. <laughs> Goodbye, Norman Jean. Oh, I never. You had the grace to hold yourself How did you hold you They crawled out of the woodwork And they whispered into your brain And they set you on the treadmill And they made you change your name That was a brief remix of Elton John's Candle in the Wind there playing on the similarity of my name, Norman Jean, and the name of the song, Norma Jean, which is just so happens to be the real name of Princess Diana. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, tell if you want a drink. <laughs> I've got some Smirnoff. Anyone want some Smirnoff? Smirnoff? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> something I've had a lot of experience with. <laughs> My mother once offered me 700 pounds for a sponsored silence. <laughs> As you may have guessed, I approached Smirnoff asking for sponsorship for this show. That They've yet to get back to me, but I'm confident they will, especially after they see how much advertising I've done for them. Can I get a cheer for Smirnoff? Yay! Yeah! I, uh, once drunk an hour with Dave Smirnoff. Uh, I, I needed urgent medical attention, but sadly my mother, who was the only one at home, and due to my sponsored silence, I could not alert her to my condition. <laughs> I was in a coma for six days. 
When I got out of hospital, mother had gone and there was no trace of the money. <laughs> <laughs> Smirn off! <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 4. Grease Andy. <laughs> so you know the song Kung Fu Fighting? I wrote that song. It was years after the original was released, but I'd never heard it. <laughs> it was on one lonely afternoon waiting to meet one of my acts, comedy double act slapping giggle. I had to break it to James and Sid that, once again, the gig I booked for them had been cancelled due to a misunderstanding regarding my dietary requirements. <laughs> it was bad news, as the boys were really looking forward to the gig, so I told them to meet me at seven in the local pub. They were going to be really, really angry at me. So to give me the upper hand, I arrived at the pub at 7am. 12 hours before they were to arrive, my plan being to act outraged when they did turn up and I, as I'd been waiting for 12 hours. They, then, my made up reason to be angry at them would, would be counter to their, real, real, to their very real reason to be angry with me. All it would cost is 12 hours of my life. So I sat there, I started doodling on the back of a backside of a beer map. By midday, I had written the first three verses of my new ballad, Kung Fu Fighting. <laughs> Feeling I was onto a winner, I frantically ran around all my contacts in the music business. But neither Greg, the janitor in the music college, or Shane, the Chinese man who sold fake CDs in the pub, wanted to invest in my new surefire hit. So, still seven hours before my meeting with the boys, I withdrew my life savings and blew the lot on a second-hand tape recorder <laughs> from a local charity shop. I then returned to the pub, found the toilet cubicle with the best acoustics, and began recording <laughs> my demo tape of Kung Fu Fighting. By 6pm, I recorded what I felt was a decent enough version to secure my career as a music megastar. <laughs> so, com so confident was I, I was going to make it, I ran up to Shen and told him that I was moving out. I whacked out my credit card and bought everyone around at the pub. At my insistence, they carried me on their shoulders around the pool tables as I played my demo out of my tape recorder at maximum volume. Before I knew it, 7pm had come and gone, and my clients slapping people hadn't turned up as they said they hadn't received my facts. So with my meeting with my clients cancelled, and as I've been sat in the pub for over 12 hours now, I was enjoying the dawn of a promising career in the music industry, so I decided to stick around for karaoke night. Imagine my surprise when, at 10.17pm, Greg the music janitor turned up and sang Kung Fu Fighting on karaoke. <laughs> How could this happen? <laughs> then it dawned on me. Greg must have spent the day using the facilities at the music college to make a karaoke version of my new song, <laughs> which he obviously intended to pass along as his own. And as for the meagre crowd cheering off his off-key bastardization of my greatest work, I launched myself at him, smashing him over the head with my most prized possession, the tape recorder, again, and again, and again. <laughs> Realising that everyone was looking at me, I thought this might be a good time for some self-promotion of my soon-to-be top ten hit, so I started Kung Fu kicking Greg to the, to the beat of the tune he'd stolen from me, while singing it, loud as my as, singing it as loud as my lungs would allow. If only the tape recorder hadn't been destroy destroyed once whilst being peacefully rammed against Greg's temple, as I generally believe that final TV rendition exceeded the quality of my demo version. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally, I had to lay low for a while until the heat was off, so, immediately, so I immediately burnt my identification and moved to Newcastle. <laughs> I kept an eye on the news, desperate to see how the police investigation was going. Imagine my surprise when Carl Douglas was arrested. <laughs> Apparently some witnesses in the pub said that the assailant was the writer of the song Kung Fu Fighting. <laughs> I had no idea who Carl Douglas was. But one thing I knew for sure, he wasn't me. <laughs> Next morning, I, vis I visited the Newcastle Central Library. Having spent the best part of a tenner on a cheap piece of disguise, <laughs> I spent my last five pounds purchasing half an hour internet time in the computer room. After taking care of an urgent personal matter, I used, <laughs> I used the remaining three minutes of my internet usage to Google Carl Douglas. <laughs> Apparently he had written, word for word, the exact same song as me nearly 30 years previously. 
so I just chalked the entire thing up to coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it was even a well-known hit. So that just goes to prove I could have made it as a music star if only Carl Douglas was born 30 years later or had been sent to prison 30 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I've since visited Carl Do Douglas in prison, mainly out of curiosity, and now in the final negotiations to manage his comeback tour. Should he ever be released? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I've ne I'll never forget the time I wrote Kung Fu Fighting, how the exact same situation happened again with Hot Chocolate's You Sexy Thing and the Bee Gees' Jive Talking. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 5. Beauty School Matthew. As a comedy manager, people often ask me, what's the most precious substance in existence? <laughs> Anyone got any suggestions? That's right, it's ivory. <laughs> <laughs> ivory is such a precious substance, people get hung for, to get it. Elephants, whale, uh, the, yeah, people get, yeah, people hunt to get it. Elephants, whales, foxes, all hunted for their delicious ivory. <laughs> and is all that ivory worth hunting for? I very much doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I am a dedicated anti-hunting activist. I think it's disgusting that in this day and age, we as a species condone and even encourage hunting. And it needs to stop. Can I get a round of applause please? <laughs> I'm glad you all agree. <laughs> I hate all forms of hunting. And do you know what I, what I hate the most? Job hunting. <laughs> Are jobs an endangered species? No. But that doesn't mean they should be that doesn't mean they should be hunted to extinction. I have applied. I have, I've applied for and been turned down for no less than 143 jobs. Now this is something that, which has begun to affect my confidence. At every interview, I, was, I would always wear my tuxedo, side part my hair, and make a point to show off my ivory cufflinks, ivory cane, and ivory business card holder. <laughs> James Bond, license to kill, I shout. Well, that's where I got them. <laughs> but neither the RSPCA, the WWF, or MI6 were impressed enough to get me on their payroll. <laughs> I've also been turned down at interviews for jobs at the following retailers, which I now boycott out for revenge. Accessorise, Aldi, and Summers, the Apple Store, Banana Republic, Bank, Barberito, Beaverbrooks, BHS, Boots, Burger King, Burton, Cafe Nero, Calvin Klein Jeans, Carphone Warehouse, Clarks, Debenhams, the Disney Store, Dorothy Perkins, Ernest Jones, Fat Face, Foot Asylum, Foot Locker, Forever 21, Gap, H&M, H. Samuel, Holland and Barrett, Hotel Chocolat, KFC, Lush, Lily's Cookies, Monsoon, O2, Pancake Express, Pandora, Phones for You, Pizza Express, Pizza Hut, a Post Office, River Island, Spider Knife, Starbucks, Subway, Superdrug, The Body Shop, The Pen Shop, Thomas Cook, Thornton's, Top Man, Vision Express, Vodafone, Victoria's Secret, Waterstones, WH Smiths, ZZ, Adidas, Golden <laughs> Bear Workshop, Costa Coffee, and many, many more. <laughs> but I don't care what the government says. I do have a job. I'm a talent manager. What qualifies to me to be a talent manager? Well, you start out as a talent scout. I attended the Scouts from the age of 6 to the age of 24. <laughs> <laughs> Despite never earning a single badge, the Scoutmaster said I must have had a special talent. Thus, my career began as a talent scout. After finding little success as a talent scout, I decided to promote myself to talent, to, yeah, to promote myself to talent manager and made myself Vice President of Andy Talent Representation. <laughs> the youngest ever Vice President in the history of the company. <laughs> As you might expect, that quote appears in my CV. <laughs> uh, <yeah>. Chapter 6. <laughs> Andy's the one that I want. <laughs> 
few professional relationships have been as significant in my career as the relationship I have enjoyed with comedy double act slapping him. Sigwick and James Benniston. I remember the first time we met, Platform 6 of Derby train station. They were alighting and had been scheduled to meet someone from a comedy agency who was interested in representing them. I was waiting on the opposite platform, dressed in my tuxedo, about to catch a train to take me to yet another state-arranged job interview. For reasons I still don't understand, they approached me and asked if I was there to meet them regarding the management role. Being unemployed, I instantly took them up on this kind offer and thus began my management career. We instantly headed to the pub where I ordered four shots of that green. There, I asked the boys what they wanted to achieve. They told me that they wanted more gigs to make money from their comedy work and to progress with their careers. Knowing nothing of the industry, I immediately promised them all their hopes and dreams. <laughs> <laughs> On reflection, I somewhat regret this, as this, is, as this was the source of a great many arguments for years to come. When I got back, when I got back to the hospital that night, I wrote Andy Routledge's Five Golden Rules of Comedy Management. Oh, sorry, uh, I should explain. I was staying at the hospital at the time, as I had no fixed address, and having learnt the hard way that sleeping rough in a tuxedo leads to a great deal of unpleasantries, <laughs> I had taken desperate measures to avoid staying on the streets. Every night, when I felt I could stay awake no longer, I'd throw myself into oncoming traffic. <laughs> when I woke up the next day, or on occasion two months later, <laughs> I was in a comfortable bed comfortable, safe hospital bed where I received a meal and had, and had awoken feeling fully rested, surrounded by beautiful women. This had been my lifestyle for four years before I met, before I met the night I met the Stuff and Giggle Boys. But back to Andy's five golden rules of comedy management. Number one, get your acts to quit any other jobs, commitments or relationships. They must be 100% committed and 100% focused. 200% in total is what I was required. And between the two of them, that was 100% each. The maths worked out perfectly. <laughs> Number two, take 10% of everything. And I'm not just talking about money earned, I'm talking sandwiches, housing inheritance, sexual advances, and funny stories about their childhood. <laughs> this approach was literally all that kept me alive during my first two years of comedy. Number three, the manager's word is final. I don't care what the reviews or the audience think. If I say it was a good gig, it was a good gig. <laughs> Number four, it is never a good gig. <laughs> <laughs> never, play, never praise your clients. They must have a low expectation of themselves as you do. If every gig is bad, they will always want to do better, requiring your services forevermore. Follow these five rules and like them, <laughs> you too could have a flourishing comedy management career with over 10 gigs booked. <laughs> Furthermore, you will be adored by your clients, who, what do you know, are now also your best friends. Last year, so I think you got five years in man. <laughs> Chapter 7, 8 and 9. Love is a many splendid Andy. <laughs> I've written almost 17 hours worth of comedy gold. However, I can never be bothered to find any gigs for myself, so my client, James Benison, in an ironic role reversal, decided to take upon himself to impersonate me and book as, ma as many open night spots as he could, forcing me to take up the gigs, or risk being known as Ilford's most unreliable comedy promoter. <laughs> Sometimes S James and Sid threatened to book an Edinburgh show for me without my knowledge, but luckily... <laughs> They never got around to doing so. I can't imagine the horrendous things they would make me say if I, if I let them write shows on me. <laughs> My comedy career came to quite an unflattering end one late September evening when James somehow found me a gig at the premier London comedy club, The Jolly Badger, a lovely venue in Edgeware, which were also doubled as a harvester restaurant. <laughs> I wasn't getting paid, but I was told I could have free, a free car for dinner. So I got there extra early, bringing a suitcase full of Tupperware, so I could stock up on the meat from the all can eat buffet. <laughs> Upon seeing the overwhelming, overwhelming amounts of ham, beef, lamb, chicken, turkey, gammon, pork, salmon, 
uh, barbecue ribs, sausage, and roast potatoes, I had a momentary lapse in judgment and gorge on the lot. The next thing I remembered, I was on stage holding the microphone in my, in my meat-covered hands, staring at the audience. I was reliably informed that I had been standing there in silence for over six minutes, until the compere, Dick, Dick Futon, came on stage to usher me off. However, I was a little on the jumpy side, and accidentally viciously beat Dick with my, my microphone for four minutes while the audience stared in shocked silence. And that was the first and last ten minutes set I ever performed. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly due to my imprisonment. <laughs> Chapter nine and a half. It's rainy on Andy. <laughs> I have a certain fondness for Kent, as I actually lived there for around two years in HMP East Sutton Park. <laughs> The first time I went there, it was for the savage beating of comedy legend Dick Futon in front of a room of 17 witnesses. I declined to use the use of a lawyer and decided to represent myself, for which my defence was that I was mentally unstable. And to prove it, brutally attacked the judge with one of the pieces of evidence. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a strong defence, I admit, and I was sent down for five years. Due to a mix-up in administration, I actually accidentally ended up in HMP East Sutton Park, a woman's open prison, but a woman's open prison and a young offenders institute. I was initially shocked, but as no one called me up on it, I thought it was prudent not to mention it either way, and boy, the things I saw. <laughs> After I was shipped for the, seventh, for the seventh time in the showers, I was put in solitary confinement for eight months. I was supposed to be in the slammer for five years, but due to another administrative error, I was let out early on good behaviour. <laughs> when I was, when I was, uh, when I left, I was immediately arrested again for practising law without a licence, <laughs> <laughs> and returned to see the girls at H M P. Being an old hat at prison now, I decided to instantly assert myself as the alpha female. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Andy's five golden rules for survival of prison. <laughs> Number one, learn the entire script of Mean Girls. <laughs> when someone gives you sass, just respond with a Mean Girl quote such as, you smell like a baby prostitute. Or, on Wednesdays, we wear pink. <laughs> Number two, at least once a week, try and throw burning oil in someone's face. <laughs> it doesn't matter who. In, in doubt, throw in your own face. <laughs> and voila, follow these five steps, <laughs> and you two can be queen of the concrete jungle. <laughs> My second visit to HMP Sutton Park was far more enjoyable, and I managed to get out with, uh, with only three shivings over the 16 months I spent there. That's also where I met my second wife, whose name was Valerie. She was my cellmate and was on the, the top bunk. <coughs> Due to the nature of the prison, however, we were never able to consummate our love, and so when I left the prison, I waited another year for her to get out too. When I did, I took her out for a romantic meal and then took her home for some sweet and loving. However, the evening was cut short when she shifted me and went back to jail. <laughs> <laughs> Yet another marriage, which ended shortly before me being managing to consummate it. <laughs> Chapter 10. Andy goes together like a Rama Lama Dama Carl Dinger Da Whilst my talent whilst my talent for management is patchy at best, I've always had a natural gift for impre impersonations, or impressions, as they're known to the layman. Many people think that impressionists are very self-centered. No, me, 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 me. That's my impression of Beaker from Muppets. <laughs> of course, my career in mimicking people was cut short due to claims of racism and ignorance. So much, so much like many of my clients, I've had to abandon my performing career due to the poor decisions of Andy Rappage. <laughs> but, but I do do a, a few good cat impressions, which hardly anyone has ever said a racist. <laughs> Now, how is that 
racist. Yes, I was dressed as a cat at the time, and it just so happened that to be a black cat with white patches of fur around his mouth and eyes... <laughs> but that makes me racist. But Andrew Lloyd Webber and the entire production team of the musical Cats is racist too. I wrote to Andrew Lloyd Webber accusing him of being a racist <laughs> to see, if he, to see if, he, uh, if he met with the same response I did when I was accused. Well, much like myself, he was furious and said such claims were ridiculous and unfounded and that they were causing him and his family significant distress. <laughs> and eventually he stopped replying to my letters altogether. <laughs> Even so, I list Andrew Lloyd Webber on my CV as a client. As I feel my, ser my service has allowed him to reevaluate the racial undertones of the musical Cats, a stage production which I have not seen then or since. <laughs> I've got this uh, family pack of cat myself here. <laughs> I don't have a family, but I like to enjoy the benefits of having one. <laughs> Chapter 17. <laughs> Hopelessly devoted to Andy. <laughs> Has anyone ever tried online dating? A lot of people talk about how online dating doesn't work for them, but I myself had a lot of success with it. I've spoken to over 12 women, and one in particular stole my arm. Her name was Sydney. <laughs> she was a dancer from Thailand and had a body to die for. We spoke sometimes over three times a day. <laughs> I've been told that I need to put a little bit more sex into my book, and as my first two marriages didn't actually result in me having any intercourse, here is a rather heated MSN conversation with Sydney in her broken English. Hello, my little Andy Panda Bear. <laughs> Would Andy like to send me room photograph? Shut up, it's, it's hard enough getting an erection without you blabbering on. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. It's fine. Anyway, I best be off. My time's always run, all, uh, almost run out, and I want to find out who this couple Douglas is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, most of the conversations were like that. Not quite, <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as long, but you get the pitch. <laughs> after, s after seven months of, of a whirlwind Skype sessions and quite suggestive text messages, I started to get the impression that Sydney may actually have been lying to me and was actually a Thai lady boy. After confronting her and threatening to fly out to see her in person, I was somewhat relieved to find out that Sydney wasn't a Thai lady boy, but was in fact my client's Sydney James, <laughs> playing one of their elaborate pranks. Plank, the boys had even set up a website where they put videos of me masturbating furiously into my webcam, which made a small amount of profit in Thailand. <laughs> Of course, I got 10% of that, so I wasn't that hard. <laughs> I still do enjoy on my dating, though. Even after I found out that the 12 other women I was speaking to were also Sid or James. <laughs> no. uh, if anyone's on Plenty of Fish, do look me up. My name is Manager Twa. <laughs> anyway, to be honest, at this point, it's, it's getting... It's essentially recipes for that. <laughs> Ooh, Hunter's chicken. It's a really nice recipe here for king prawns. <laughs> oh, that's a section I never finished writing. Ooh. You've got to see these pictures of tomatoes. These are brilliant pictures of tomatoes. Oh no, oh, those aren't tomatoes. <laughs> I, I actually don't know what vegetables are. Oh, it's not a vegetable, it's a fruit. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. Anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> you see, this book is mostly uh, recipes because my autobiography started off as a cooking book. <laughs> <laughs> cooking with C.D. Andy, that's what it was going to be called. Why a cooking book, Andy? I hear you scream 
Why a cookie book? Why a cookie book? Why a cookie book? Why a cookie book? Because I like to cook. <laughs> Here's a sample recipe. <clears throat> Ingredients. 350 grams of unsalted butter, softened. 350 grams of golden caster sugar. Six eggs, beaten. 140 grams plain flour. 280 grams self-raising flour. Zest of four lemons, juice of three, about 100 milliliters or three and, a half, uh, three and a half fluid ounces. For the syrup, zest and juice of two lemons, 100 grams of golden caster sugar. Number one. Heat the oven to about 160 degrees Celsius, or 140 on the fan. Prepare the inside and the outside of a 23 centimeter tin. Cream the butter and sugar together in a light, until they are light and fluffy. Then gradually beat the eggs a little at a time. Spoon the mix into a tin and bake for an hour and 15 minutes until well risen and golden and a, and a skewer inserted comes out clean. Once the cake is out of the oven, Leave to cool until it's just warm. Pour the syrup over, letting it completely soak in after each addition. Leave to cool completely, then either wrap up or fill, fill um, and ice the cake. The unfilled cake will help keep well if you wrap it with baking parchment and cling, or, and cling film for around four days, or in the freezer for up to a month. How was that for a recipe, everyone? That's right, it was a wedding cake. <laughs> The vast amount of recipes I have, the vast amount of recipes I have uh, came in handy when my autobiography was uh, eighty percent short of the required work. <laughs> so I just popped in several hundred recipes, and soon the pub and soon the publisher was begging me to reduce the work count. <laughs> well, what do you want me to do, Nigel? Nigel said the book was too little into my actual life. But Nigel, for God's sake, I have written everything in my life up until the very point. The last three chapters are is me on the bus to this reading. <laughs> <laughs> and so with a little more of my current life to put into my autobiography, I decided to write about my future. However, <laughs> by this point, I've become accustomed to writing the style of recipes, which is somewhat appropriate for the conception of my future child. <clears throat> Ingredients. 89 kilograms of male. <laughs> Female, beaten. Zest of four lemons, flavoured condoms, Tesco's own. 500 pounds of currency. Six ounces of Rohypnol, optional. For the syrup, seven gallons of lubrication, 100 grams golden casting sugar. And here's the five step method. Heat up to 180 degrees Celsius or, or fan 160 degrees Celsius. Have dinner. Take your, eight, take your 89 kilograms of male and take it to your nearest bar to attempt to find the female. Number two, attempt to add the 500 pounds of currency to the chosen female until she consents to have intercourse. If there, resist, if there is resistance, add the six ounces of a hit to the chosen female's drink and whisk while it dissolves. <laughs> Number three, wear all four condoms. It plays to be careful, especially when it comes to conceiving a child. <laughs> Number four, do all the positions, all three of them. To guarantee conception, hold the chosen female upside down for 30 minutes after you're done. To help coerce her, add 100 grams of golden casting sugar. Females love that stuff. The unborn baby will keep well if you wrap, it, if you wrap the mother with baking parchment and cling film for up to 273 days, or in the freezer for up to nine months. <laughs> and voila. Following these five steps, after nine months, you'll have one child. I will call mine Thanos. Or William, if it's a boy. <laughs> and so we get on to the very end of my autobiography. In an attempt to raise more cash, the entire last chapter is devoted to promoting my new single. So I printed out the lyrics right here. However, readers of my book may have problems imagining the tune, so those suckers will have to buy the real thing. You lot, however, are very lucky you get to hear it live. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> That's right, it's a song inspired by my childhood dream. A long life obsession of being an astronaut. A topic I haven't touched upon in this autobiography. I can't even write my own song properly. 
I'm not. Uh, I'm missing my wife. There we go. We got there in the end. It's lonely and it's space. On a such a time lost flight. <laughs> So touch down brings me round to find I know the man they think I am at home. Oh no, I'm a rocket man. Rocket man, burning at his fuse up here alone. I think it's gonna be a long, long time. So touch down brings me around. I know that man I think I am at home Oh no, no, no Rocket man Rocket man Burning out his fuse up here alone Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids In fact it's Cold as hell, <laughs> and there's no one there to raise them. <laughs> if you did, <laughs> and all this science, <laughs> I don't understand. It's just my job five days a week. A rocket man. A rocket man. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time to touch down with me round to find. I'm not the man they think I am at home Oh no, no, no I'm a rocket man Rocket man Burning out his fuse up here alone And I think it's gonna be a long, long time Till touch down with the ground to find I'm not the man they think I am at home Oh no, no, no I'm a rocket man Rocket man Burning up his fuse up here alone And I think it's gonna be a long, long time And I think it's gonna be a long, long time I think it's gonna be a be a long, long time. <laughs> and I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this. The one and only reading of my autobiography. <laughs> Whilst I did let you all in for free, I would appreciate it if you thought it was worth more than nothing to throw some money in the bucket on the way out. The money will of course go towards printing more of this, one copy of the book, and will help me to afford to buy another 20 cassettes to record my latest single off too. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. You've been great. Good afternoon. Aww.
Oh, I'm going to call it. At least you were paying me. What are you doing?